And so I can say, Pakaranga, the ecclesia that continues to pray. As we are, aren't we? Last uh, week, Brother Robert got up here and initiated the six month prayer challenge. Brother Robert initiated a six month prayer um, challenge. We are seven days in. Be good to. How are you going? What a blessing it's been, I have to say. We personally were thinking about how we could get prayer into our family. We wanted something else to make prayer just seem normal. And then we had this exhort, and then we had a structure. <laughs> it was handed to us, and so this week we embraced it, and we choose to pray around the table after dinner, which is quite a good time, I've figured. Um, and the kids can add, have their input. If they can't figure out what to say, they've got the list. And also we encourage just other prayers as well, what they're thankful for. And that's really important. The Ecclesia that prays. May we be ever known as the Ecclesia that prays. Let's keep going. Let's keep the momentum. Uh, Chris said that this might be part two. Not sure, Chris. I did a talk to the Invercargill CYC last week on prayer, and because I am I feel like my prayer study, my knowledge of prayer and how it fits and how, it was, how it's all started and, and just the, the early stages of prayer is pretty fresh, I feel like this is part one. And then Robert did part two last week. So we'll just backtrack a little bit. Let's go back down to basics. How we want to start, though, is this statement. Because you have prayed to me. I would like and I would encourage us all to take this statement with us when we pray. We're in a six-month challenge. Let's consider this statement. Now, this is a statement, a phrase from God. Now, someone, a man in the Bible, heard God say this to him. This is a statement that is said immediately after a prayer. This is a statement that is said just before God responds to the prayer. What a cool statement. Because you have prayed to me, this is going to happen. Anyone, anyone going to guess? No, it's not Daniel. Nehemiah, no. Yes, Hezekiah. Hey, there might be more, but that's the wording that uh, that was in my Bible. And uh, what a special little phrase that he heard from God. Because you have prayed. Shift here. It's a little bit like um, this verse here. Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. Think about it. I would like you to take this phrase with you when you pray. And I want you to imagine that God is saying this. No, wait, no, wait. I want you to know that God says this to you after you've prayed. Have a look at that verse. Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful. This is not a verse saying, continue steadfastly in prayer and then move on with your life and try and just keep going with by your own strength and hope for the best. This is a verse that says, pray a lot, then carry on, but watch. Watch expectantly, expectantly, for God's response. That's what this verse is saying. I want you to know that God is saying to you, because you have prayed to me, here it is. And being watchful means that we are, we are trying to get our eye in in God's response because it may not necessarily be exactly what we imagined. Getting your eye in. 
being watchful. Just the littlest tweaks, the littlest moments, maybe a big mighty hand. Who knows? So, what we want to do from here on in is how I normally like to do it. Hebrew word. The Hebrew word for prayer. Then we're going to jump into the first time the word prayer appears in the Bible. And we want to see how, um, what sort of information is extracted from that. Then we want to go to Hezekiah and just see how that went down. And that's when we're going to finish right before the emblems. Hebrew word for prayer. This is the root word for the Hebrew word prayer. It is made up of the letters on the right, pay and lamed. Now, this is the root word. I like to start with the root word. It's just sometimes works best, just to, just to get you off onto the right track. But you know me. I don't like the modern Hebrew. Remember, each letter means something and was represented by a picture. So I'm going to put some pictures up there as to how these letters used to be represented and just see if we can fill out a little bit more about this root word of prayer. The letter pay is represented by a mouth, an open mouth, a speaking mouth. And the letter lamed is represented by a shepherd's crook, talking about teaching and guiding. It carries the idea of authority. As a shepherd has authority over the flock. A literal understanding, if you look at this, could be speak to authority. Some of you might be thinking, well, why isn't it speak with authority? Good point. But when you look at the word prayer in the Bible and how it's used, prayer is a communication to the God, to the God, or a God, a higher power, right? So are you speaking with authority? No, you are speaking to authority. And that is potentially a literal understanding of how this word is made up. But that's not the word. This is the word. The word for prayer is parallel. And you will notice there are two lamads. And like almost any language, I reckon, when things are doubled up, it emphasizes what was being said in the first place. First, we were speaking to authority. In the word prayer, we are actually speaking to the ultimate authority. There's more to it. Let's have a look at the root word again. And let's have a look where this root word is found in other words, one word, and see what word that is. This is another thing you can do. The root word for prayer is found in the word nafel, which means fall. The rain falls, just to use it in context. It may not necessarily be a fall from a great height, actually, because I'll show you a, a verse which captures this idea where fall could, be, could work with the idea of prayer. Talking of a nation of people who come into submission to the king of Persia, Cyrus, in Isaiah, it says, they shall come over in chains and bow down to you, and they will plead with you. The word plead there is palal. That is the Hebrew word for prayer. You get the sense that people are falling to their knees, and they are speaking to authority. So perhaps, and this is not my words, this is someone else's take on a literal understanding of this word. When you gather all this together, perhaps palau means to fall down to the ground in the presence of the one in authority pleading a cause. Let's just take another little look at... Uh, the idea of speak. I just thought this was amazing. The first time I thought I saw speak in the word prayer, I thought, wow, God actually allows us to speak to him. Brother Justin covered this exact point in his class on, on Wednesday. 
the great creator of the universe, the creator of this earth, us, and all that we know, allows us to speak to him. I want to tell you a funny story. It's not a funny story. It's an interesting story. It is kind of funny, though. Esther. Esther had a message to speak to the king. It was a very important message, and she had to get it to the king. Actually, it was her husband. She wanted to speak to her husband, a man, because her husband was the king of Persia. However, it was a law that you would never, ever speak to the king unless summoned. Otherwise, you would die. Esther had a problem. She couldn't just speak to her husband. So, what did she do? What do you think Esther then did? She initiated a fast for three days. And although it doesn't say pray, the Hebrews connect fasting and prayer together. What I'm saying she did is she prayed to the creator of the universe so that she could consent, get consent to go and speak to a man. That's what I'm saying happened here. It's a very upside down, backwards way of doing things. I'm just trying to say here, God allows us to speak to him. Even though some men don't even allow us to come into their presence. Just want to zone in on the other part of this uh, word is the authority part. Who is the authority that we come to? It's a shepherd's crook. I want us to perhaps take this vision when we think about the authority that we speak to. The Lord is my shepherd and I lack nothing. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear nothing because he is right there. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. This, brothers and sisters, is the authority who we come to, the authority we speak to. Jesus says, fear not, little flock. It is the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. That's the Hebrew. So, how about the first time prayer is used in the Bible? Genesis chapter 20. It's not actually the first prayer, I would say, but it is the first time the word prayer, palau, is used in scripture. This is the situation where Abraham pre-plans that his wife should be his sister, just for the time being, and he moves into an area called Gerar. This is the area of the Philistines, and they come into contact with a guy called King Abimelech. Abimelech takes Sarah into his house. What a crazy thing to happen. Think about it. Abraham's there in his tent, all alone, wondering what is going on in the house of Abimelech with his wife. But here's Sarah in the house of Abimelech, and God has put in the minds of the men there to not touch her. So there's Sarah in the house of Abimelech, surrounded by absolute strangers and godless people, no one's touching her. She's just standing there in the corner. Don't know how that all worked out. It's just one big, massive, awkward moment. But a blessing of an awkward moment. What God then does is he comes to Abimelech in a vision. He speaks to Abimelech. And the first thing God says to him actually is, you are a dead man. You have taken a man's wife. And Abimelech's response is, what? No way. I am innocent here. I thought she was his sister. And God says, I know you're innocent. But, and I kept you from sinning. 
because I made sure that you and all the men in your house did not touch her. Doesn't change the fact that you're going to die if you don't give her back. So this is what he said. Now then return the man's wife for he is a prophet so that he will pray for you and you shall live. First time the word prayer is used. God is using the word prayer. Story continues. 10 verses later, Abraham prayed. God healed Abimelech. God healed the whole house of Abimelech because God had closed the wombs because of Sarah's sake. God had rendered the house infertile because Abraham prayed. This is what happened. Um, no, sorry. God restored their fertility because Abraham prayed. Let's consider this and just see what we can draw from it. The first time prayer is used, what is God saying? Sometimes in the Hebrew, the first time things are used, God is saying, take notice, gather around, have a look to see what happens. This is the baseline. This is how I want things to work. How? First thing we can, we can draw from this is God dictates the prayer. He says that a prayer is necessary in this situation. It's not, a, it's not Abraham prayed and someone prayed and, and this is what happened. God is saying someone is going to pray. So what I think is, God is saying is, God is saying here, prayer is important. I want people to pray. This is happening, people. I look at this situation, however, and I don't see how prayer is necessary. I'll tell you what I mean. God is in control of the whole thing. He's got everything sorted. He's stopped the men from touching Sarah. He's going to bring Sarah back. He's talked to Abimelech. God is in direct contact with Abimelech, and he tells Abimelech everything. He says, this is what's going to happen. You've done wrong. We're going to fix it. This is it. Why is prayer needed? God is in control of all of this, and yet, and yet, and all of that, God says, a prayer is going to happen. I just want to highlight, how much does God want prayer, despite the fact that he is in control of absolutely everything and all will be according to his will? He still wants a prayer in there. The next thing we want to consider in this story is the basics. God answers prayer. Obviously, the first time prayer happens in the Bible, God is going to ensure that the prayer is answered. Because everyone, this is how prayer works. This is prayer 101, first time in the Bible. I'll also add the, the comment, the prayer is the catalyst by which things actually happened noticeably. As I, as I said, God is in control, but a lot of it is unnoticeable. God stopped the men from touching Sarah. He had um, controlled the whole thing. But what was noticeable was when the fertility was restored back to the house of Abimelech. And that happened because Abraham prayed. That was the most noticeable difference. Aside from the fact that Abimelech kept his life, but I mean, he just stayed living right throughout. He never died. The most noticeable thing that happened was that restoration of fertility. God did it, but Abraham initiated it with his prayer. This is a powerful witness, isn't it? Don't you think it's kind of funny in this situation that a prayer is not dedicated to the rest restoration of Sarah and getting her back into the house of Abraham? A prayer here is all about witnessing and preaching to the Philistines, showing God working through Abraham. Which brings me to my next point. God indicates clearly who is in communication with him. Abraham is your go-to man. Abraham is praying for you. You want to know about God? You want to know about me? You go and talk to Abraham. And that is how God works. He works through people. He chooses his representatives, his chosen people, the people of God, to pray. And to be the people that other people know to pray. Now, this is an interesting point. 
It's important that other people and the people we mix with know that we go to church. We go every Sunday and it's a great witness that we give up everything and we come on here and we do this thing. We remember Jesus and we come together and sing. It's important that people know that we do Bible classes, we do Bible school. But God is saying it's important that people know that we pray, that other people know that we communicate to him. It's another level. That makes us the go-to people as communicators to God to know how he works. It also puts the spotlight on us because if we believe prayer works, they'll be watching. And we do believe prayer works because it does. First time prayer is mentioned in the Bible. Isaiah 37. Perhaps you could turn to it. Assyria is coming. Assyria, a formidable, aggressive force, is sweeping across the world. It has taken the northern part of Israel and it's descending into Judah. There is no one that has more pressure on him than the king. King Hezekiah. And so what happens in Isaiah 37, prior to the descending of this great army into, into Judah, into Jerusalem, he receives a message from Rabshakeh, an Assyrian. And the message is so incredibly disheartening. It is a message about you are finished. You cannot stand up to the might of the Assyrians. Look at all the other cities we've taken. I'm just paraphrasing. And so if you go down to 37 verse, verses 14, this is the moment when Hezekiah receives this very disheartening letter from this messenger, this Assyrian messenger. He received the letter and read it. And there's no nothing else in here in the Bible apart from this next statement. And Hezekiah went up to the house of the Lord and prayed. Hezekiah did nothing else. He thought nothing else. He went straight to the temple and he prayed. And you know what he did? He spread the message out in front of God. Here you go, God. This is a challenge to you. This is your problem. And he prayed the most astonishing prayer. O oh Lord God of hosts, God of Israel, enthroned above the cherubim. He's come into the throne of God. You are the God. You alone of all the kingdoms of the earth. Incline your ear, O oh Lord, and hear. Open your eyes and see and hear all the words of Sennacherib. He has just forwarded on his problems to the almighty God. In prayer. What happens after that is astonishingly amazing. Isaiah comes to him with a message from God. 21. Isaiah says this to Hezekiah, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, because you have prayed. There it is. This is why we're here. This is our take home phrase. Because you have prayed to me concerning Sennacherib, king of Messiah, this is the word that I speak. Quite a lot of words come. But if you go down to verse 33, God zones in on the Assyrians. Therefore, thus says the Lord concerning the king of Assyria, he shall not come into the city. He's not even going to shoot an arrow, it says. He's not going to put a shield up. He's not even going to cast up a siege mound. Um, by the way he came, he's going to go. Uh, I will defend the city for my sake and for the sake of David. That is the response that Hezekiah received because he prayed. And of course, God actioned it. And the whole Syrian army was dead overnight.
brothers and sisters, because you have prayed to me, let us take this phrase with us in our prayers, after our prayers, and just before God responds. Let's think about how this works. I want you to include it with our six month challenge every time we pray each day. And so we come to the memorial of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we want to consider, just before we take the emblems, God saying to Jesus, because you have prayed to me. Because Jesus prayed, what happened? Tell you what happened. Because Jesus prayed, he resisted huge temptation. Because Jesus prayed, he chose very wisely his 12 disciples. Because Jesus prayed, he fed 5,000 people. And then later, 4,000 more. Because Jesus prayed, and it was an all-night prayer this particular time, he went down and he walked on water. And later, he calmed a storm. And in the garden, because he prayed in the garden, over and over and over again, not my will, but your will, not my will, but your will, God strengthened him to go to the cross in complete faith. And Jesus saved us. Jesus saved us because he prayed. Thank you.